May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you this morning. Uh, we welcome you this morning, friends. God has gathered us from our homes and from our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our individual lives to this place. You may have seen the flowers as you came through the gathering room and passed through there. Those are given today in loving memory of John Lovern. Uh, and you may see those here in the sanctuary with us given today in honor of Roy and Doris Ryan's 93rd birthdays. We give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for his work in their lives and in each and every one of your lives today. God has brought us together today to be the people of God. We want to celebrate that God has brought us together and that each of you are here. And to do that, we need you to let us know that you are here. At the end of each of your pews, there is a black pad. And in that pad, there are some cards where you can let us know that you and your family or whoever you came with today are worshiping with us today. And so pass those around. As you do that, you can look around and see maybe who you have never seen before, or maybe you're seeing them for the first time in a while, and make sure that you give them a warm hello before the end of the service. We would also love it if you are a guest or a visitor with us today. Uh, if you would like to, you can leave us whatever contact information you are comfortable with so we can reach out and say hello and help uh, you to get to know what all is going on here at First United Methodist Church in Tupelo. We have a lot going on in our lives together this week. We're in the middle of our Let's Shine weekend. As you probably know, you may have seen the pictures of us serving around in our community at Helping Hands and Tree of Life and Beds for Kids and Habitat for Humanity and the ICC Wesley Foundation and Traceway. Uh, and then coming back for our first sessions with Dr. James Howell, our guest preacher this morning, who we will be introducing you to later in the service. He was here uh, yesterday afternoon and earlier this morning. You can join us again as we continue our tour with him. He'll be here for session three this afternoon at four o'clock we in Wesley Hall. If you don't know where Wesley Hall is, that's the, the part of the building that's on the other side of the campus in that direction. Um, and then we will bid him farewell with some Connie's uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30. That's a small bribe. We're not above it. Um, uh, this isn't your last opportunity to learn and grow with us this week. Come on back for our What's Up Wednesday. We have dinner at 5 o'clock and then our programming for youth, children, and adults at 6 o'clock. Uh, this week, the Tupelo Community Theater is going to be here for their uh, program, Give Me That Old Time religion, so we will all be enjoying that together. Uh, looking just a little farther down the road, uh, during our Wednesdays in Lent, we'll be studying Dr. Howell's Unrevealed Until It's Season, a Lenten journey with hymns. You can get it in the bookstore locally here, uh, and you can also, if you, wherever you'd like to get it, but you can, if you need some help ordering it, you can let Bonnie and the church office know. She's going to make an order on February the 6th. So you can call or email her and get on her list as well. well that's a little of what's happening in uh, our life together and in God's work among us. We give thanks to God together. And so let's now turn our hearts and our minds to worship.
friends, let's rise together and join in our call to worship. Happy are those who delight in the Lord. They rise in the darkness as the light of the upright. The righteous will never be moved. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. Holy God, you gave the law to show your people the way of righteousness. Help us receive your commandments as grace and live as your obedient children, that your goodness may shine through us to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, open our understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the word is proclaimed, we may receive holy wisdom to understand the gifts you have bestowed on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Joshua chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods of your ancestors, your ancestors served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are willing to, unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors, your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the great house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. morning. We're privileged to have with us this weekend as our guest and guide, Dr. James C. Howell, who for the past 20 years has served as senior pastor at Myers Park United Methodist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina. We've waited for his visit for three years as we dealt with COVID-related postponements. Finally, he's here. Welcome, James, to Tupelo and First United Methodist Church. Dr. Howell is a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and a graduate of the University of South Carolina. He received his MDiv and a PhD in Hebrew Bible from Duke Divinity School, where he has continued to lecture on preaching and ministry as an adjunct professor. Dr. Howell has authored 20 books, including the recently published Unrevealed Until It's Season, A Lenten Journey with Hymns, which will serve as our study resource during the season of Lent. James is married to Lisa, a photographer and community activist, and they are the parents of three grown children. Dr. Howell is a nationally recognized thought leader and speaker in the United Methodist Church. Please remember that we have another session with James at 4 o'clock this afternoon in, the, in Wesley Hall. 
and a getaway breakfast for some informal discussion and Q&A with James before he heads back to Memphis on his way to Charlotte. Following the gospel lesson, James will bring us his message. Thank you.
lesson was from Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter. Here now, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness <coughs> exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom heaven. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. church and uh, what a warm welcome I've gotten here. It took so long to get here I decided the reason it took so long I decided to walk instead of fly. <laughs> um, putting a stranger in, in charge of something as important as the morning sermon, I don't know, my mind's gone to um, when Bill Bradley was uh, his former NBA guy, senator from New Jersey, he was at a uh, dinner for business and political leaders and sitting at the head table, and the server came along and put a pat of butter on his bread plate, and Bradley said, uh, two pats for me, please. And the server said, no, 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 only one pat per person. <laughs> this infuriated Bradley, and he said, you must not know who I am. I am Bill Bradley, uh, NBA all-star, congressman, senator from New Jersey. And the server said, well, sir, you must not know who I am. And he said, well, no, I don't. Who are you? He said, I'm the guy who's in charge of the butter. <laughs> I haven't told that in years. Um, <laughs> so I'm the guy in charge of the sermon, and um, uh, it's so good to be here. What a beautiful church, and um, uh, getting to know Rusty better. You know, what a great pastor you have, the others on your staff. You know, great um, stuff. Uh, I gravitated toward this verse, Joshua 24, 15, which says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's actually the title of my favorite marriage book, uh, not that anyone here would need any help with something as easy as marriage, of course. Always hazard the observation, people never come in my office with marital trouble and say, you know, the trouble I'm having in my marriage is I am just getting too much encouragement from my spouse. <laughs> never been said. Uh, Joshua says these words, uh, they're on the plain of Shechem, it's in the late Bronze Age. The Israelites have come into the, the Promised Land I think when I was a child, I had the idea that sort of blitzkrieg light, they'd steamrolled the whole place and took over, but they really took over just small little parts of the land. There were still a lot of Canaanites around who had their own gods that were just way cooler and more fun than Israel's gods. And so they were always tempted to follow them. Uh, Joshua was saying you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. It's a big choice. It's not a little choice. It's a big choice. 
Uh, it's not about being vaguely spiritual. It's not about slipping into church when it's convenient. You have to make a, cho a choice. It, it's a big choice. It, it's not about um, agreeing with the preacher anymore, by the way. I know when I first was in the ministry, I would preach, and if somebody wanted to pay me the highest possible compliment, they would say, Pastor, you stepped on my toes today. No one says this any longer. Nowadays, if somebody wants to pay me a compliment, they say, Pastor, I agree with you. <laughs> we don't come to church about agreement. We come to church to be stretched, to be challenged, to think. I told uh, the group last night, read something recently, uh, if you want to have good mental health as you advance into old age, and as I look around, some of you are advancing into old age, even as we speak. Uh, the greatest trait that you can have is curiosity. Curiosity. And I know, and you know, older people, that they've lost their curiosity. They've got everything figured out. They're happy to tell you the answers to all the questions that they know. And this is bad for your mental health. It's not a very Christian thing either. I love Mary Oliver's uh, very short poem. She said, another morning, and I wake with a thirst for the goodness I do not have. Another morning, and I wake with a thirst for the goodness that I do not have. Uh, I've talked uh, the last, uh, yesterday uh, and this morning, about St. Francis of Assisi, who was, uh, he was, he was cool, he was popular, he was rich, but he had a break with his father because he decided he wanted to be a saint. He wanted to become humble. He wanted to give it all away and uh, do a radical thing for God. His father took exception to this, and uh, they wound up divided, sadly. Uh, I've been talking about travel during this time here. Uh, I have a kind of wanderlust. I don't just like to go places. I like to show people other places. And I, I, believe, I, I do believe I inherited that from my father. He was in the Air Force. He was gone all the time when I was a kid, flying to other countries and so on. It seemed really cool. My father uh, died not from COVID, but during COVID. Uh, my youth director, he loves to say, COVID's been harder on teenagers in high school than anybody else. And this is false. COVID was the hardest on people like my father, who were alone somewhere dying and no one could visit them. So my father died alone of COVID, not from COVID, but during COVID. Uh, after this happened, uh, I discovered this interesting thing. Everybody in the church thought I knew, they knew how I feel. They all came and hugged me and said, oh, I'm so sorry you lost your father. I know exactly how you feel. I'm sure you have so many happy memories. Oh, I'm sure you're just grieving so deeply. I'm sure you were blessed to have such a wonderful father, on and on and on. You can imagine. The kind of stuff that church people say. And I didn't answer them because it was just too dang awkward to say, I can't really think of any happy memories with my father. It was too awkward to say, you know, he was a cold man. It was too awkward to say he didn't like what I did for a living. He did not care for my wife, on and on, uh, church people. I wrote a blog about this. I wrote it just for my sister's benefit. Then I decided to publish it, and it went viral. Thousands, tens of thousands of people all over the country read it, and I began to hear from people who said to me, you've described my father. I didn't think it was okay to talk about my father. Thank you for sharing your story about your father. There should be a rule in church life, and that is that we never say, I know how you feel. I do this in my marriage all the time. I, I want to be a sensitive kind of good husband, and, and Lisa's there, and I think, I will read her mind, and I will know how she feels, and I will know just what to do. And I'm horrible at mind reading. And I've discovered this really quirky thing with Lisa. If I ask her how she's feeling, you know what? She will actually tell me. It's like an amazing thing. In church life, we don't say, I know how you feel, or you must feel a certain way, because what that does is that causes a lot of pain to the person who doesn't have the right feelings. I think it's why Jesus' uh, best story was about a son and his father. 
You know, he told the story of the man who had two sons and one went away to a foreign land and squandered his living. The other stayed home and was very good indeed. Um, that story reminds me of a, a wonderful thing. Let me share you a little bit about my. I have a daughter named Sarah who is an ordained pastor. She got married five years ago. Uh, we were ramping up toward the wedding and she called me one day and she said, Dad, you know how at a wedding uh, they have that first dance, that first uh, father-daughter dance? I swallowed hard because I just don't dance when I do it's so embarrassing and I said <clears throat> yes she said I don't want to do that I tried to restrain my glee and I said oh she said I have a better idea I said what is it she said I want to have a first song with my dad. I'm a pianist. My mother wanted me to be a piano player. I disappointed her terribly by becoming a pastor. I'm a pianist. My daughter's always uh, been a great singer, so we did a song at her wedding. It brought the house down. It was better than any dance. She sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Dare to dream where dreams really do come true. The reason she chose that song is that we all remembered one of the best moments from her childhood when she was five years old. Our church had a talent show, and she was a great old singer, and I entered her in the talent show, and I took her down front, and I perched her up on the piano and had a candelabra up there, kind of cabaret style, and I sat at the piano, and she sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Judy Garland never sang it better. <clears throat> It was absolutely amazing, and so you know when it, when it finished, you know we 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 I got her down off the piano, and we took our bows, and there was uproarious applause from my church members, and I went side stage, and uh, Sarah followed me, and I, I picked her up, and I twirled her around, and I just said, "Honey, I love you so much." The woman who was in charge of the show was standing right there. She said. I wish my father had done that. And I said, you wish your father had played the piano? <laughs> and she said, no, I wish my father had loved me. Friends, we're the ones who know that God, our Father, loves us. And we forget about the nature of that relationship. As best I can tell, when my children were little, I did a bunch of things for them. That was nothing. If I could go back to their childhood again, I wouldn't do more things for them. The moments that I would retrieve from their childhood. I remember my son, one night, he was just sad. He knocked on my bedroom door. He said, Daddy, can you come out here? I went out there. He took my hand. He was like five. And we went down on the couch, and he just put his head on my shoulder and... I still don't know what that was. We just sat there for an hour or two. I'd take that any moment. I said at our morning session, Jesus' nickname was Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us. That's what you need. That's what my father missed when he died. If I could have, despite everything, I would have been with him. God our Father is always with us. No matter how it's gone, no matter what has happened, and if God is with us, and if we understand that, then we cannot help but be with those others who are God's children, who are suffering in some way. My daughter Sarah preached a sermon a couple of weeks ago. I loved it. She preached on Jesus coming out. Like, I love that. She started the sermon, like, she's going to talk about Jesus coming out. She said, what he did at his baptism is he came out. He'd been this obscure guy in Nazareth that nobody knew anything about. But at the baptism, a voice from heaven comes, and there's a dove that descends. And the voice says, this is my beloved son. I'm like, oh, that's who he is. He came out, and the rest of her sermon said, it's time for us to come out as Christians, it's time to come out, be open about it, be public about it. We come out as Christians, some people get confused. I've said this to other people. Those of you who haven't been, I need to tell you this as well, and the others of you need to hear it repeated. <laughs> it's so important. Churches get confused. 
They think that if we're children of God, uh, what we do is uh, we pass judgment on other people. That's just not a thing in the family of God. When my kids were little, the one thing that they really just couldn't do is pass judgment on one another. She was getting on my nerves. Well, sorry. You just have to grow up and get over that. We're a family. We love each other here. Churches aren't meant to pass judgment. Churches are meant to do, I've told this before, I'm just going to repeat it again, and then I'll be done. I've told the story twice now about uh, this guy named David Brown. He's a choral conductor. He went to the town of Springfield, Ohio, with a bunch of flyers and started sticking them up on phone poles and shop windows and would hand them to anybody. He bought a hamburger. He handed it to the guy who sold the hamburger. And the flyer said, come and sing with us Thursday at 7 o'clock. And he passed hundreds of these out, and hundreds of people showed up to sing with him Thursday at 7 o'clock. And there were tall people and short people and white people and black people and conservative people and liberal people and confused people and absolutely brilliant people, educated and uneducated. And they all came and they sang together. And he made them start talking to each other. They told their stories. And people were listening to others who had such different life experiences, people that they thought were crazy, but but they listened and they love. Church is supposed to, we're supposed to be the ones who say, come and sing with us. And when you come here, we're not going to tell you how you ought to feel. We're not going to say we know how you feel. We're going to sit still and we're going to listen. And you can tell us how you feel. And you will not be judged in this place. You will be loved in this place. Come and sing with us. Come and stand with us. There are people who need us to stand with them. I think about after uh, George Floyd. You know, nobody knew what to do. Some protesters took to the streets. Other people were saying, blue lives matter, and so on. I think I did the right thing, and a lot of my friends did. We just called African-American people that we knew and said, can I come sit with you? Can I come stand with you. It didn't fix anything, but it seemed to mean the world. We had an anti-Semitic incident in Charlotte right after that. I have a Jewish neighbor. I just went over and just sat with him. Like my son curled up with me on the couch. That's what we do. We stand with people. We're about to come in a line to come forward for Holy Communion. I love Holy Communion. I hope you do. It is the body and blood of Christ in some mystical, miraculous way that I don't understand and you don't understand and we can't explain it and that's what makes it beautiful. Can't figure it out and compartmentalize it. It's a mystery. It's a miracle. God will move in this place. And what I love, two things I love about it. One is, is you will take the body of Christ into yourself. I don't know about you. I don't want there to be any distance between me and Christ. I create a lot of distance between me and Christ with my stupidity and arrogance and cockiness and pride and waywardness and selfishness. I don't want there to be any distance, and at least in this moment, there is no distance between me and Christ. I take him actually into me. He becomes a part of me. The other beautiful thing about this is um, you're going to stand in a line. I always warn my people, because I know they're impatient, they check their watches. Are you checking your watch now? Am I talking too long? I was worried about that. I know they're going to be checking their watches, so I say, this is going to take a while. And that's exactly what you need. You need some time in God's house with God's people. You're going to stand in a line. Martin Sheen, you know, Martin Sheen played uh, the president in West Wing. He's a very devout Roman Catholic. I heard him interviewed one time about his faith. He said, I love it in church when we stand in lines. He said, it's just this great mystery. I don't understand it. It it boggles my mind. But I love standing in line. I love seeing the line. When I look at the line, what I think is, I'm with those guys. I'm with those guys. We're going toward God together. It's a beautiful thing. Friends, thanks for letting me be in charge of... uh, the sermon today. Next thing in our service is to affirm what we believe. And I tell my folks, uh, you don't have to ask intellectually if you believe at all. It's aspirational, right? This is what God hopes we will live into one day. Us friends, let us stand and join together in our affirmation of faith, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Hear now the invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let us offer one another signs of peace and reconciliation. As forgiven and reconciled people of God, may we now offer ourselves and our gifts to our God.
Loving God, we give thanks for all that you have given us and praise you for your astounding goodness. Receive the dedication of our hearts, our minds, and our bodies for the ministry of your church. Bless our offering for the work of your kingdom and give us wisdom for the right use of all that you have provided. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me at the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy God, God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. For this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and be thankful. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, that was poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray. Praying, our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. body of Christ is given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. My friends, we are gathered together today from all over this community and surrounding communities far and wide. And I remind you that, yes, we are a united Methodist congregation. But this is God's table. And all who are here are welcome. There's a place that is provided for you. A place that God has prepared for all of us. And you are welcome here. I'm going to ask those who will be assisting uh, to come and as they gather, uh, it's a little different for us today, so allow me to offer a couple of instructions. Our ushers will be guiding us, but we will have two stations here at the front for the front section, and there are two stations at the back. You will come, you will be offered the bread, and then you will be offered the cup. Uh, following your taking of the cup, you are to place the empty cups in the bowl. May God's Spirit be with us as we form a line and as we come knowing that it is a time to come for this wonderful gift.
If you would pray the prayer with me that's printed in the bulletin. Eternal God, we give you thanks for his holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we sing our final hymn, we invite our children's choir members to come forward to lead us as we sing. Would you stand? I just said that that is a uh, beautiful sight that we are seeing, the beauty of God reflected through his people. We share together in a meal, not for business and political leaders, but for God's people who are broken, who are hopeful, who dream, who believe, who serve. 
So friends, let us join together in our dismissal, which you will find printed in your bulletin. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May Christ, the true light, shine upon you that you may walk in righteousness all your days.